Hey everybody, today we have with us my friend and founder Gautam Gupta. Gautam is the founder of Highbeam, a rapidly growing startup based in New York. Uh, they are building a banking and finance platform for e-commerce founders. They've been around for over a year now and are a team of 10. So Gautam, welcome to the show. I'm very glad to be here. Thanks for asking. Yeah, yeah. No, thanks for being here. Um, so like I said, Gautam is a founder and uh, we want to talk about your journey as a founder, the lessons you've learned, uh, the common misconceptions people have about starting up, and uh, yeah, what it means to be a founder, and also about startups in general, and what it's like to work at a startup, and then so on and so forth. Um, but before we get into any of that, I think it'll be good to just get a little bit of a background of who you are and, and what led to the founding of Ibeam. Sure. Um, so, I guess going really back in short, um, I started programming really young. So like when I was like 12 years old, I wanted to hack my brother's ARPIT account. ARPIT is a pretty old social network. I don't know if you have quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, um, yes. The first but one. yeah, the yeah. first one in India, yeah. so to say. Um, and I just created like a phishing page, learned online how to like do that sort of stuff and um, hack, his, hack my brother's account. Um, but in retribution and stuff like hit the internet for like a week or something, like the router. Wow. So that was his way of like getting back at me. Okay. Um, but uh, while doing that and in the same online communities, there were like programming tutorials. So I just like were curious to like how to create like a calculator or like some like other visual basic app or PHP or Android. Um, so I just started doing a lot of that stuff and contributing to like open source. So and you were doing doing this in middle school. Middle started in middle school. Yeah. went into high school um, and yeah basically decided I wanted to do like pursue CS or like be in tech things of like that um, so went on to like University of Waterloo to study CS um, and Waterloo has a good co-op program so you end up doing like different co-ops mm -hmm. in different areas so I think that's like really valuable to like see like different stage companies in different areas you know engineering um, and just like I guess um, also have always wanted to like start a company, like I've always wanted to start a company. And for that, those reasons, um, the co-ops I saw like chose were based on like, they basically acted as like stepping stones in that direction. So like some like early stage company or like something that's like really engineering heavy or something that's like um, later stage company. Mm -hmm. So I got to experience like different types of companies and all those experiences um, sort of like combined um, gave me a really good outlook of like okay what it means to like go from a company of like five people to like even say like 500 or 1000 mm -hmm. um, and after I graduated I was at Alloy for about two, two and a half years. What is Alloy? Um, Alloy basically sells to consumer brands and it's like basically helping them with better like retail analytics solutions, so like optimizing the supply chain, optimizing their like sales outlets, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so basically after working for two, three years, I felt like now is the right time to like start something. Um, so I took the plunge and I started hyping. Mm -hmm. And that was just over a year ago? Yeah, a year and a half ago or something okay. is when I started like doing go on research. Got and um, try to like see like who would be the right person to work Got with. And stuff we'll like get to that in a second. That is also very interesting. But so you grew up in India and then you moved to Canada, you know, Street of Waterloo <laughs> for pursuing CS. That's right. And then you had a bunch of co-ops and you got to see uh, different size of companies, startups, small and big. And, um, and that all sort of eventually led you to think of what you want to do and, and yeah. things like that. You mentioned you always wanted to start a company. Where did that come from or, or how far back does that even go? Yeah, I'm not sure where exactly that started from. Um, I think um, just growing up, um, always hearing like inspirational stories of like people um, starting stuff and like, um, like just making companies or like in the tech industry even. Um, and thinking that maybe I can do this one day and like have something that I've like built from scratch. Um, 
was just like something I started thinking of as a teenager. Yeah. Um, and that's what like stayed with me as a dream. Yeah. So, yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, and so, yeah, you were talking about your co founder search. So mm-hmm. that, that's a very interesting thing. And this is one of the things that I specifically wanted to ask you. Yeah. Um, where, you know, there are a lot of sort of preconceived notions of uh, what starting up should be like and what, a found, what it means to be a founder and how you should start up. And one of them is obviously that you should have a co-founder, yeah. and people, and which is important. And uh, people also talk about a co-founder should be your friend. You should have a co-founder. There are common stories of friends starting companies in college, or uh, friends who work together and then they quit and start a job. Um, and that's the narrative that gets sold in the media. But you, you didn't have a co-founder from day one, as I understand. You decided that I'm going to do this, and then you started searching for a co-founder. Yeah, that that's right. Um, so how did that happen and did, was this a notion in your head that how, how can I start I don't even have a co-founder was that a blocker or was that like no I'll just find one um, so I guess in sequence of events I did not start a company before I went on the co-founder search mm-hmm. so I went on the co-founder search before starting on anything okay. um, and the my thinking was that I'll find a co-founder and two of us or whatever group of people would find like well stuff like figure out an idea and work on it together. Right. So that's what we did. Um, but just like um, in the co-founder search, I reached out to like a lot of people I knew mm-hmm. um, and a lot of friends, a lot of like friends of friends, right. people online. Um, the thing I realized is that um, a lot of my friends were in like very stable positions and it's just very really hard for me to like convince them to like um, take a plunge when things were like very risky before like there was any funding, there was any idea, stuff like that. And I was not able to like break that, I guess, or make them jump over that hurdle right. um, that I was going to jump over myself mm. um, in a way. And there, there can be that hurdle for like different reasons. Maybe people are not in a stable financial position or they have other like blind factors, stuff like that. So it's not like everyone's ready to be able to like make that jump. Sure. But out of the pool of people you know, um, it's it can be hard to like find that right person who's like willing to make that jump with you. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. But that would be my instinct too, I'll just ask my friends. And if no one's ready, I'll be like, oh no, there goes that. <laughs> but you didn't do that. You went you found other ways. Yeah, um, so I had friends um, post on like um, online communities, stuff like that, and just um, reach out in their networks to see who would be like willing to, I guess like, who is looking for like a technical co-founder in a way. Mm -hmm. Um, I was not specifically looking for a non-technical co-founder, like I could have also worked with other technical co-founders. But Um, that is the common like, uh, right match, right? If you're technical, you want someone non-technical and vice versa. That's That's right. A good uh, sort of yeah, yeah balance. It's, it's a macho skill set. So yeah. like, if you are handling engineering, the other person can be handling like business, customers, that side of things. Right. So totally. Yeah. Um, yeah. So how did you find your co-founder? Um, so my friends posted on like different communities, like on Tech Fellowship, or um, also like create like a YC co-founder matching profile. And through one of those avenues, I got connected to my co-founder Samir. Um, and we basically like start chatting, we chatted for like three months and over the course of three months, um, we worked on like some mini projects or like just try to like make something work. And I was also like seeing like what, um, things somebody was thinking about, how, how is he thinking about them? And if we do need to make decisions, are we able to like arrive at those decisions in a relatively quick time frame? Mm-hmm. And without like... Um, too much, I guess, like uh, arguments or something right. like that. Like we may have opinions that are strong, but if they're loosely held, um, I think that's the key thing we sort of need to look for. Yeah. yeah, yeah. In addition to like other things, whether that person can handle stress, which you can sort of like take other things as proxy, like has that person done like engineering or like um, been in like Intense consulting or, sure. type roles or stuff like that. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's one of the other factors. Makes sense. So three months of conversations, projects, 
yeah. uh, discussions, idea generation, I imagine, and then you're like, okay, this is the guy. Like, That's yeah. right. And also, like, um, just seeing like if the other person is making progress in that time frame, mm -hmm. and um, in my case for Samir, like Samir was actually trying to make progress on the idea he was working on, regardless of like what, regardless of our conversation. Right. Um, so I think that's also important that um, the person has actually like has intent of like doing something and is mm -hmm. like making good progress on that. Right. But it is, I mean, it makes sense. It's a very important decision. So you have to yeah. spend that time exactly. to think it through as to uh, if you match well with this person as well, because you have to work with them for a very long time and very closely every yeah. single day. Right? You're in the yeah. trenches with them. Awesome. That's right. Another thing you mentioned is uh, that you felt that this was the right time for starting a company. You had worked for two, three years full time after graduation, and you felt that was the right time. Um, and this is something I have seen some of the uh, you know tech uh, the, the tech thought leaders talk about as well as to what the right time is and what's not. What, what's your take on that? Why was that the right time? Why not five years from now? Why not five years ago? Why why was this the right time for you? Yeah, um, it's a good question, and I think it really came down to a conversation I had with a friend, and he was. We were talking about it, and he sort of like made me realize that you need to like um, think forward and backtrack. So like, when do you want to have like a family or like have stuff like that? And if that's like um, thirty years old, for example, would be a new age. But um, and how much time you need to like? Do you think you want to spend in the startup phase of develop trying it out? And if that's like two three years. Um, in which she could be in a stable position, then you need to do like 30 minus two, three years, which is like 27. And I'm like, when I started on this journey, I was like 25 ish. Right. So it's like pretty close. And it's like, um, maybe it's the right time to do now because either yeah. I saw like do it before all those external things that could be affecting my energy to like start a startup, or I do it after, which is actually what my co founder right. says. Um, uh, age or experiences and I s decided to do it before because mm -hmm. uh, I was like okay I think I have enough experience yeah um, I do feel like I can like go out and like build a startup and just like work my way through it mm -hmm. learn on the fly if there's skills I'm missing right. um, and also I don't have like other like health problems for example sure. like um, I don't have any like major debt or stuff like that. So yeah. I don't have to like worry about those things. Yeah. Um, so time wise just seems right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. No, that makes sense. No health problems. You're young, you're you're fit, you're exactly. you don't have obligations, you don't have debt. Sounds like sounds very reasonable. And your co founder doing the kind of the other side where he's right. gone through all the responsibilities and now he's got all the experience and that benefits also yeah, for sure. There is definitely a benefit. Uh, and then after that point now he's starting out. Yeah. Because, but it is a big, because it is a big responsibility and a big sacrifice and you have to be in the trenches every single day. Um, so this is, I guess, you know, this is also interesting and I don't know if I have a question here, but something mm -hmm. I've observed where when I was in college or, or high school and I also had some of these yeah. aspirations or thoughts of maybe joining a startup or doing my own thing someday. Uh, and my perception at that time was precisely this, that it would take a lot of sacrifice, a lot of responsibility, um, and just a lot of work every single day. And like, I would, I would, I was imagining like no vacation for years or like, you know, no social life or whatever. Just I imagined there would be a lot of sacrifice, <laughs> at least for, from whatever I had read or seen, maybe that was a narrative that I bought into or whatever. And then now fast forward eight, 10 years later, uh, I often see the opposite, where the founder life is glamorized. Uh, especially, you know, you go to, when we're in New York, we go yeah. to tech parties or events, and uh, you see all these founders there, and they are there at 5 p.m. Some of them, not all of them, I mean, some of us. And, and so, somehow, sometimes, for some founders, it seems like it's they're living a glamorous life. Uh, or at least that was the case 2021, 2022, we're in the summer 2022, <laughs> a lot of shit's going down right now in the economy, so maybe tables have turned, but, you know, at least when I first moved to New York last year, I, this is what I observed, wow, these guys 
they don't seem to be working 100 hours a week. They're working normal hours. They're going on vacations. They're going to conferences in Miami. And like, okay, this is it easy? Like, what is happening? Is there just money flowing in? Has have the tables turned because of all the capital? Has the game just become easier? Uh, and that was something I, I couldn't make. I, I couldn't reconcile that in my head to the previous notions I had had. And maybe the answer is in the middle. I don't know. Do you have a yeah, thing? Yeah, I guess um, I, I see myself somewhere in the middle, like um, of what you thought your perception was and what yeah. you felt it was like last year. Yeah. Um, so, for example, for me, like my weekdays are like really long. Um, yeah. I'm in the office from like somewhere between nine ten a.m. to like until nine p.m. Right. Um, most weekdays. Yeah. But I take my weekends to recharge, so I basically right. don't do any work. Like right. we're recording this on the weekend. Yes. Um, and I try to push all my social activities, dinners, friend catch up, stuff like that, right. to like the weekend. Right. Um, but you have to. Uh, yeah, right? I have to. Yeah. There's literally yeah. like more time for yeah. me to like spend on weekdays. Yeah. Um, for other stuff, and I also like, like, I still try to like make time for myself. For example, like work out during weekdays, weekends, yeah. but. I, uh, I do not go to any conferences or events during the weekdays unless it's like a Friday night. Sure. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I'd say I stand somewhere in the middle because just of how yeah. hectic work can get. But do you think that maybe, I mean, you have to put in that much work, right? Yeah. It, it is hard Definitely. to build something from scratch Definitely. and uh, have it make money and have, it, have customers use it and so on. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I like to think of it as like a like a wheel with like edges, and to put the wheel into motion, you need to like really put so much force into like yeah. joining it. But yeah. once it's starting to become in motion, the edges start becoming smaller, so yeah. the wheel is becoming smoother. Right. And the edges to begin with are like funding or investors. Um, yeah. There's like customers, product, yeah. team. Um, and like other things right. and you're sort of like making progress on like different edges of different times mm -hmm. so like when you hire someone the team edge gets smaller when you mm -hmm. sort of like have built like an MVP the product edge becomes smaller mm -hmm. um, but to like just push the wheel into motion the founders need to like exert so much force right. um, that it's like intense yeah yeah, yeah. that makes sense um, and speaking of, you know, let's get into the challenges. You've mm -hmm. been at this for about a year and a half. Uh, what's been the biggest challenge so far for you personally? Um, I'd say the challenges change from time to time. Um, like before, and I've also like improved on different things. So I guess yeah. starting with the challenges, um, the first one really was to like, figure out what you were building or what you were doing. So for, I guess once we come, once Samir and I committed to like working with each other, um, we started on this journey and we were like, just talking to a lot of like e-commerce founders for like a long period of time and trying to figure out their different pain points, stuff like that. But it's like a months long process and coming from an engineering background, like I like to like code and stuff and that's my tangible work output. Mm -hmm. But when you're like having those conversations, um, you're not really like coding or like right. putting out like tangible work output in a way, at least from my perspective, um, which is then, back then. Mm -hmm. um, but you need to like figure these things out and it can be like a very really ambiguous situation and mm -hmm. where like you don't know which direction to go in. There's multiple different paths you can choose with different outcomes. But you need to like figure out which path is like right for you based on your like backgrounds, business value, um, what customers want, right. uh, what you think is like achievable in the future. Yeah. So that was the first challenge, and then once you have sort of like figured that out, there's like funding, other stuff, team building, like actually being able to like hire really good people on your team. Right. Um, and it's like it took many many months to mm -hmm. get you like our current teams stage mm. and the first hire was the hottest hire mm. um, and then it's sort of like started becoming a little easier for us yeah but so those were some intermediate challenges and now it's really like now that we have the team we, we are building a product mm -hmm. um, and we need to like uh, find customers who are sort of like 
want have that problem and like willing to work with us in the beta stages. Yeah. Um, when we still don't have a fully like fleshed out product. Right. So <clears throat> I think the challenges have changed over time. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd say it's the overarching challenge is to like be able to deal with these different yeah. things as a group. Because you have, you need to wear multiple hats. Yeah. And, you can, um, and the like, all this stuff falls on you at the end. Yeah. Um, and you need to be able to like persevere through those different things. Yeah. Makes sense. So one uh, specific challenge that I want to ask you about, uh, which is interesting to me, because I, I also I've been an engineer and I've recently moved into a PM role. I was an engineer in big tech and I moved into a smaller company. Uh, in a PM role where it's, it is ambiguous and I'm having to do a lot of, uh, so I have a lot of responsibility yeah. in a way that I didn't before in terms of dealing with people or dealing with ambiguity or uh, leading a team in some ways. Uh, and you also, you were an IC software engineer at, uh, I guess, a reasonably big company and now you're the founder and you are leading a team of almost 10 and you are the engineering manager, and I think now you're also not as much of an IC at your own company because you have a full team to manage. So what's that been like? Has that been a challenge? Uh, do you feel overwhelmed by it at all? Um, I guess a little bit of a challenge, but um, even though I've not led teams in like professional work settings, um, I've been doing like things in university and I think mm -hmm. um, like clubs or different like project teams stuff like that sure so I think just having that leadership experience from university or like high school days even is, yeah. was like very helpful yeah because you're basically like working with people so you need to yeah. like be able to like um, talk to people empathize with them and see also like one important thing is to like figure out what their goals are mm. and like where they want to go what they want to improve on what are they looking out of the experience stuff like that um, and work with them to like help them achieve those goals. Um, and I think based on like um, these different things you can do and people management, you can sort of like develop over time the mm -hmm. skill people of like people management or just like working with people. Right. Um, so I'd say it's a slight challenge to do that in a work setting. Um, also because uh, the people on the team so far on the insurance side have been my friends from before mm -hmm. so it's a like i'm basically their peer in a way mm -hmm. um and it's um you're coming into so like a different setting but if you manage it professionally i think it's totally fine to do um but yeah i would say like you definitely definitely need to like learn some things and i've also tried to seek out like mentors to um, who, who have been in the engineering leadership roles and like that for right. like a long time right. um, and have these conversations with them like what problems arise when you're sort of like starting a company and mm -hmm. when you are like trying to scale it right. so um, I would say just like seek help where you yeah. sort of like need it yeah. Um, yeah makes sense how's your experience going from software to PM um, I mean it's it's been great I, I have enjoyed uh, most, if not all aspects of it, I would say. Um, it's something that I knew, I, I had done a lot of research on the role. I had a PM internship before. I had started to take on product management-ish responsibilities at my previous job on the site, like I was scoping out a project or uh, leading more groups for yeah. projects and things of that nature. So I, I think I knew what I was getting into. Uh, but yes, this I hadn't had a full-fledged uh, PM only job before right. for a long time. So in that sense, it, it was definitely new in, in so many ways. Um, yeah, I think a lot, a lot of it has been around dealing with ambiguity, especially because I joined my company at a time where it was going through a lot of change. They had just raised the Series D funding. Uh, they had switched and they, had, they were trying a new product line and we're in this scaling mode. I right. Think. Um, and lot of structural changes inside the organization and so really what that meant for me what has meant for me in the last six months or so is a lot of ambiguity uh, not always having defined scope not always being told hey this is your assignment go work on this and which is the fundamental difference i think 
even yeah. just from a PM and engineering where right. as an IC engineer, especially in big tech, you're pretty much, you have your user stories, your tickets, and you just work on it and that's it. That's that. Sure, sometimes you contribute to design, sometimes you contribute to best practices and so on and so forth. But largely that is tangible output. Right. Um, and I think for me it was A, not having tangible output and learning to be okay with that. Right. And then B, which is also something that you talked about, um, and then B, uh, not having or not always having defined scope hmm. and sometimes being the one to find and create scope, right. uh, which, which is interesting and it's fun and I enjoy that. Uh, and I guess why did you want to switch from software to PM? Um, I think the whole, if I backtrack a bit, the whole yeah. reason I got into CS or Eng uh, was because I thought I I had an idea for a product or a startup. This was back in high school, so as junior, senior, high school, and uh, I wanted to build it. And I didn't know coding at all at the time. And I decided to learn to build this this web app. And I built it. And that whole experience of building something from scratch, it felt like a superpower. It felt like wow, I can sit at my desk and build something by myself that could be used by people across yeah. the world. <laughs> that felt like a superpower. Yeah. So that was the starting point of why I got into it. Uh, but what I realized was that for me, it was always about the end product. Hmm. And, you know, I did CS in college and uh, all of that. But for it, I, the realization I had was I cared about the impact and I cared about the end product. And I cared about all aspects of yeah. that product and taking it from scratch to launch and everything. And I didn't even know that PM roles existed until I think junior year. And I did, I'm doing internships and I'm like, I'm being told what to do, right? And I'm being right. told what to build. I'm like, wait, why don't, why don't I, why can't I be the one to have the idea for what to build? I'm like, okay, maybe it's because I'm an intern. And maybe <laughs> once I, once I graduate and join a uh, software engineer, yeah. I'll get to decide what to build. I'll get to decide which uh, button goes where and which feature we're working on. But that's obviously not the case for good reasons, yeah, right? For good reasons. For good reasons. So I, so I think I was naive in that sense. I didn't know PM was a thing, and I was approaching it as that being an engineer meant being also the one to determine what gets built, which is not true. So I think for me, it started off. That was a starting point that I wanted to be the one making product decisions, and I was excited by that far more than I was excited by deciding which library to use or okay. which or how to optimize yeah. code for X Y Z. Even though all those things are important and I don't to be right. good at it, but that was a starting point. And then I knew I had some of the skills and traits that could make me a good PM. I did a PM internship I, and then, yeah. And you were mentioning that in, during university, you were sort of like thinking about like founder or like entrepreneurship, stuff like that. I guess, do you want to start your own company someday or um, I guess, why were you interested in entrepreneurship? Yeah, yeah, I was. I think uh, not too dissimilar from your story in my high school, even maybe middle school, as young as mm. 13, 14 years, 13, 14 years, I remember being uh, excited about the idea of starting something of my own, about yeah. building my own company. I was also inspired by, you know, the, the tech uh, success stories, right. be it Jobs or Gates or yeah. Mark Zuckerberg and so on and so forth. Um, and yeah, I was. I was. I was in high school. I was in college. I think reality started to hit different <laughs> sometime around close to graduation. Um, and yeah, I, I I don't know if I can pinpoint what changed, uh, but that I think at there was a certain point, maybe from sixteen, seventeen, all the way to, to nineteen, twenty, where I was. I had decided that yes, I was going to start a company and mm -hmm. this was the thing, this was the goal. And at some point after that, that changed. Was that 16, uh, 17 or was that 1920? No, I, I'm saying from In those time, ages, okay. I definitely wanted to. Got it. I remember that being very top of mind that this was my goal and I'm going to do it. Uh, somewhere after that, somewhere after 20, 21, mm -hmm. 22, after graduation, I don't know, that that became less at the forefront of my mind. I see. Um, I don't know if I can pinpoint exactly why, but I think it's a combination of reality hitting and also yeah. I also came from India to the US and the realities of the immigration and visa situation make it hard to right. just not have a job and not be in a big company. 
and no one around me, none of my, not a single one of my immigrant friends had this in their mind. Probably similar reasons, maybe different reasons, I don't know, but that also then affects the way you think about things. Um, and I think now I've started zooming out a little in the sense that, yes, I am still excited by the idea of starting my own and all of that, but I, that is not the goal in itself. I think for me, the goal has now become, I want to build products. I want to build products that uh, make a difference yeah. on the lives of people that have an impact on the world. And uh, I want to do a damn good job of it. And I want to be with the best people in the field and, and work on that. And to me, it doesn't matter. And I want to have a certain level of autonomy and control while I do it. But it doesn't matter if it's at a company or if it's my own thing. Got it. Uh, I think that's where yeah. I'm at right now. Yeah. And if it if it's at a company and if I have and yeah. if I'm excited about it, then that's great. Yeah. And I'm making those contributions. And if I'm doing my own thing, then that's great too. Uh, that's the way I'm thinking about yeah. it right now. Totally. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so shifting gears a little bit yeah. to hiring, you mentioned that as one of the challenges. Uh, and I know you've hired a few of your friends, but now, and I've seen your team grow from what, three people to eight, nine people mm -hmm. uh, and growing still. And, uh, and I anticipate that, you know, at a certain point, you're not hiring friends anymore. And now you're interviewing people and now you're convincing them to join. Uh, so A, what are the hiring challenges that you foresee coming up in the in the next phase of your company over the next one two years and uh, second part of this question is what do you look for um i think hiring challenges change pretty rapidly in the early stages of the company um when it's just me and samir the challenge was really to like um okay, we are like step zero. We need to get to like step 0 0.5. Um, and there's certain specific set of engineers who are excited about that mission or like mm -hmm. that stage of the company. Mm -hmm. um, and you need to like convince them about the founding team, like, and the idea that we're pursuing and try to get them on board. And it's like a really drawn out process. Mm -hmm. um, and the engineers who sort of like thrive and like um, when the underlying ground, I guess the framework has been like laid out of like mm -hmm. what you're trying to do and like um, now we just need to like go and build um, is a different set of challenges. So I guess in the very early stages, the first, I'd say like one to three hires, we had to like really work on that initial set of challenges of like mm -hmm. convincing them, them talk to our investors um, mm -hmm. and I think it's uh, like trying to find like mission alignment like, that the mm -hmm. problem we're solving, they also like sort of like resonate with it. Mm -hmm. And that's all like continues. But um, I think um, when what starts shifting a little bit when you sort of like go from like five to 10 is more like those people are sort of like looking for that foundation to have been like, like laid out. Mm -hmm. um, and also like starting to see some progress on the product like is there a natural product is there like some beta customers that you have um what's the like how's the outlook looking and i think what we will have in the future from this point down is like how have those customers been using your product um, and like what are the upcoming challenges maybe they become more engineering specific challenges than like product like what are we doing type of mm -hmm. challenges um and i think those will be things we'll have to like deal with mm -hmm. um in the future but yeah it's a very like i'd say it's it changes every two months mm -hmm. at this point right um and what's the second part of your question yeah so i mean what do you look for uh and mm -hmm. specifically i'm also interested in what are the skills and traits that are needed yeah. to join a company at your stage versus right. uh, yeah. where you were before, Alloy, or versus a big tech or versus a bigger company? Right. Um, so I think in terms of looking for, I'd say you're really trying to build like a, you could even say like a sports team mm. at this stage because it's like 10 to 15 some people. Um, and it's really like specific 
it can be specific skill sets that you're uh, looking for. It could be like um, maybe a breadth of knowledge, or it could be like this person can just do like anything, like give them a problem and they'll like solve it. Mm -hmm. um, so you're trying to like find these different people mm -hmm. and it's not more like someone knows like Java or something. Sure. That's really not the um, concern you may have um, right. when you're like making hard decisions at this stage. But basically like someone who's smart, uh, who can like take an ambiguous problem, break it down, figure out all the right things need to be done, like ask the right questions if it's very ambiguous, and talk to the right people. So, like if they need to work with designer on something to get designs, just like do that. Um, figure out how to like break this into like engineering work, work with me to like, um, I guess, lay it out over three or weeks that will like lower this feature yeah. and just be able to like do this end to end. Yeah. Um, is so the person and the I think the people I found who self like are able to do this are either like ex founders. Mm -hmm. So they have tried to do something in their past but maybe it didn't work out or but they still want to work in small teams. Mm -hmm. Um or like future founders who wanna do this in the future, but um this is mm -hmm. um so like their learning experience in a way. Sure. Um, so I think the people we have attracted so far have sort of like fit that mold a little bit, mm. but maybe changes in the future. Right. Uh, but yeah, I guess that's my realization yeah. so far. And would you say that that kind of person, if there is one trait and, and probably that, or one of the few most important traits is just high agency? Yeah, um, I would say so. And just like being resourcefulness, asking the right questions, being yeah. able to like, persevere through like a problem right. and the ups and downs you yeah. know because that they're gonna come yeah yeah makes sense and so similarly if there is someone looking to join a startup especially at an early stage startup uh, or actually rather how, how, how should someone think about what stage and what sector they should join if they want to try this startup experience and maybe they've only worked at big companies so, so far um I think it truly depends. If you're looking to just join for the monetary aspect, it doesn't make sense to join like really early stage when it's like two, five people, big team. Because um, I think you can join a later, maybe Series B plus type company and have a higher monetary reward because the exit is sort of like nearer and more certain. Mm. Um, but if you want to just work in a small team and just have that like close knit team experience or like um, work on a where you like early stage problem and figure out the different like solutions just like you like being in ambiguous settings. Mm -hmm. um, I think then you sort of like should try to look for like early stage companies or if you want to like start something in the future like just working at an early stage company is a really good experience like when I joined Alloy which right. is the company I worked at full time. Mm -hmm. I started as an intern when it was like about 10 people big. And yeah. then I was sort of like grew to like 70 ish people right. by the time I left. So it's, and I also had co ops when the team was like five people. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's really valuable to just see like how processes change, mm -hmm. how things, like as new team members come in, at what stage of the company, how like the dynamics change, what, yeah. um, what the company starts focusing on, and right. where does the um, efficiencies and efficiencies right. come in. Um, so I think it's valuable to sort of like be able to like see that and use yeah. that in your future experience. Yeah. So it's almost like schooling for, for founding your own company, like join an early stage. In a yeah. way, yes. Yeah. 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 Makes sense. Um, so there's another misconception or, well, I shouldn't say misconception. I think there is a preconceived notion mm -hmm. that a lot of people have, uh, and I think I did too at some point about starting up, which is that you must solve a problem that you are facing, that that is one of the best ways to find the idea and or that you should be passionate about the problem that you are about to solve. And, uh, you know, there are these stories of people starting up because one day they suddenly saw something and they had an idea and they right. pursued that. Um, but your story is a little different. You, you didn't do this at all. You yes. decided to start, you found your co-founder and then you right. came up with the idea. Um, so what's your take on this yeah. and how did this happen for you? Yeah, I'd say um, there is, I think one of the pieces of advice I got before I started on this journey was to like 
really think about who your customers will be and if you feel passionate about building for the customers. Mm -hmm. um, and so maybe I want to change that preconceived notion that you should solve a problem that you're facing to solving a problem for someone who you care about. Mm. And like working with those group of people, maybe it's you yourself. Sure. Um, but then you would feel passionate about like building or like solving the problem because mm -hmm. once those customers um, start like using your product, once they receive like value out of your product, you will feel satisfied. Right. Um, and I think that's the um, mindset difference you can have um, when you may not necessarily have a problem that you're facing yourself. Right. Um, <clears throat> In our case, our customers are like brand founders. Mm -hmm. So people who may have like e-commerce stores like Shopify, Amazon, or even like physical presence. We have some customers who have physical stores in Soho, New York. Um, and we, I guess me personally, I saw it like resonate, them, resonate with them really well because they're also like entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And they're like trying to like start something from scratch, build mm -hmm. something. and they have all these like hurdles that they need to like go pass through mm -hmm. um, to like become successful. Mm -hmm. So I felt like resonate with that like founder um, mindset in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, I've also worked in e-commerce industry before. I was at Shopify and Alloy was somewhat related as well. And what I realized was that um, e-commerce founders, like they're like really passionate, energetic people, mm -hmm. love what they're, what whatever products they're building or like selling and they if you get on a call with them you'll feel you leave energized like they're like good at like talking inspiring you and stuff like that so i think all that combined made me really passionate about like building for them right and after that um we started talking to them about like their problems and mm -hmm. like different things they're doing and when you saw like start talking to them and try to understand the process so like try to embed yourself in their company a little bit in a way, um, you'll find different things that they're, the challenges they're facing and mm -hmm. you can like choose one and sort of like um, figure out what you know, like help them with. Um, so that was, that was something that I or we did. Right. Yeah. So being customer obsessed, not idea obsessed. Yeah. Yeah. Cause there's definitely like B2B ideas and yeah. it's not like everyone has had that specific challenge themselves. Yeah. Um, so I think just like talking to the customer is more important and figuring out like what their pain point is yeah. or are, is more important. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but also I think what, what I learned from your story yeah. is that it's not that the idea will just come to you one day and only then you can start. You, That's right. You can, you can start and you can find the customer you're passionate about, yeah. learn about their problems and then find the idea yourself. Totally. It's a journey. And I, I think what's most important is that you need to have that intent of like doing it. Yeah. Um, and I think once you sort of like set your mind on doing something, um, you can like work through it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that's basically what I try to do. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, but I guess, I guess shifting gears, like changing topics mm -hmm. totally. How's your experience in New York been so far? Because you moved from Seattle, mm -hmm. and how's it come to New York? How do you compare the different cities? Um, I, I love New York. Uh, I used to come here once a year, pretty much, when I was in college, because I went to school upstate. Um, and I, I've always loved the city. I also grew up in a big city like New York in India, Mumbai. Uh, a lot of similarities in terms of as, as dense and as uh, you know similar sort of go-getter uh, kind of mentality and there's a energy in the air that you really feel here uh, and so I, I love it i have always loved this city uh, for the dynamism the the energy the diversity of people um, and, i mean seattle was nice it was a beautiful city but a little slow for me for <laughs> my 20s fair yeah fair even in terms of walking and and you are a fast walker and all that so I, I like the pace of uh, these people walk. Yeah, I, I walk faster than the average or most New Yorkers. Yeah. Which I feel pretty proud of. Right. Like so in Seattle, they would call that sprinting. But, uh, <laughs> um, and what different things have you found to do in New York, I guess, outside of work? Because um, your work is primarily remote, right? I guess you maybe go into work 
Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm at a distributed company, so there's a few people in New York, and uh, but yeah, uh, I don't have to go to the office, but I do go up two, three times a week. Um, uh, it's not been that long, but yeah, outside of working, I play tennis and work out. I try to explore events. I'm into the arts and performing arts and things like that. So. And I try to explore that, and this is the best place in the world for that. So. I know that you got into performing arts, or like you have always had a creative side mm-hmm. to you. Um, and I guess when did that start, and how's that sort of like transformed or changed over the years? And how do you, how does it manifest in you today? That's yeah, a deep, multiple <laughs> questions there. Uh, three, yeah, three questions. Um, I think, I, I, I don't know, I mean, it starts as kids, right? Everyone, I think all kids are artistic in some ways, but for me it's thick that I really loved uh, some of these things. Like, uh, I remember my, my first performance on, I, I act, so my first performance on stage was at the age of eight. Uh, I played Hagrid. And I never, I'll never forget that. That, that was the first, perform, first time I went up on stage and performed, and it was amazing. And since then, acting's been something that I've loved doing. I've done workshops, I did it in high school a little bit. Uh, a fair bit in college, plays, and I was in a few productions, and um, I was in a short film. Um, so yeah, so acting has been one, and then I was also, at some point in elementary school or middle school, I realized I was kind of good at writing, and around 13, 14, I got into creative writing quite, quite a lot. At one point, I think I wanted to become a writer as well. Uh, and that was a serious consideration. <laughs> Until I met a writer in Mumbai at a workshop, I quit. I quit school that day to go to this writing workshop. So all adults and then me, 16 year old kid. Uh, and that this guy told, said point blank that, hey, if you uh, want to be a writer or, or a creative artist in, in a true sense, in a very true sense, then you have to be prepared to live a life uh, of not as much material comfort. Right. And that stuck with me. And that's been a question. Okay. Um, and I think it's reality. I think yeah. that so, uh, if you want to be an artist in the true sense, and by true sense I mean not someone who builds stuff just to pander to what's giving them money, but like the true artist who just writes for the sake of whatever the creative right. art of it, then it's very hard to be to, to make money off of that. And, and like one point zero zero one percent of people do that. I think the start, the success rate there is less than a founder, if I may say so. <laughs> but. Uh, so that's that stuck with me, but you know, I, I still yeah. like it. I I, uh, I, so I I try to write and I try to act when I can. It's difficult as a adult with a job because mm-hmm. it's hard to be part of productions and stuff. But, but I know you go to like um, I guess open mics or poetry slam stuff like that. So you yeah. try to like still manifest that creative side of yours and even like doing this podcast. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not interview, the same, but sort of. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Something. Yeah. Sort yeah. Of, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I want to keep it alive. I think that that's all it is. I don't uh, want to make money off of it necessarily or uh, make it big. I've considered that and I've thought it through for a long time and I've experimented with little projects to see how that could be done. But I think I've realized that for now, I'm going to focus on one career and then let this just, just be alive. And, you know. Just be alive. Yeah, it, 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 it's like a muscle, right? Like you have okay. to keep it alive, you have to keep training it. So. Whenever I get the chance to write or do an open mic or act, I will do it, and that's it. Awesome. And inspired a bit by uh, David Sachs, who we uh, know the big the VC and uh, yeah, founder, ex founder, the PayPal guy. He after PayPal or after he after he got his big exit from PayPal or maybe the next company, uh, he went to Hollywood and made a movie. Really, I uh, didn't know that. Yes, it was called. Uh, no smoking. So there's, he made a movie. It was a really good movie. It's like a docum. I don't know if it's a documentary or or, or an actual movie, but it was about uh, smoking and why it's bad for you, something okay. like that. But it did really well, and he did that. Uh, and so like that is part of it. Like maybe uh, I'll have my startup <laughs> exit one day, and I'll go to Hollywood and make a movie because I have the money. So. Right. Yeah. But that, that's a side dream. I'm sure it will happen someday. So, so. cool. Awesome. Cool. All right, this was a great conversation. Uh, thank you, Gautam, for all your stories and your insights. Um, yeah, thanks for having me and also like sharing your um, like experiences and stuff like that. I think it's really, really valuable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, thank you for, for prompting those questions as well. 
Cool. Uh, thank you, everyone, for for watching. Uh, this is Gautam. I am Manan. You can find uh, if you want to plug your startup. <laughs> they might be hiring soon, I think. Highbeam.co. So, Gautam, founder of Highbeam, uh, and Manan, signing off. See you all next time. Bye bye.